And that was the whole thing about my career and wanting to be a journey person acting was if you just hang in there long enough, like if you hang in there till you're 30 and then all those women go and have babies, if you just keep hanging in and then if you hang in till you're 40 and people can't bear looking older on camera and then if you just hang in till you're 50 and, you know, I just, I'm just going to keep hanging in there because eventually the, you know, the pool gets smaller. <laughs> Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Holy moly. Today's guest is the embodiment of compassion, empathy, play and fun, as well as doing the work. Roz is a seriously talented and all-round human and I was left mesmerized and blown away by her many insights and philosophies on life. I was very fortunate to have this conversation in person and to say I was grateful is an understatement. That being said, gratitude is one of the themes of this podcast and you'll soon see why. So let's get into it and officially introduce Roz to the podcast. Roz Hammond is a highly accomplished theatre, film and television actor as well as a writer and director with some of the most credits in the Australian industry and has been doing this for 30 plus years. Her numerous television appearances include 60 episodes of The Heights, 10 series of Sean McAuliffe's Mad as Hell, 5 Bedrooms and Jack Irish. Other long-running roles include 3 series of The Librarians, 3 series of The McAuliffe Program, 3 series of Skit House and Thank God You're Here, together with guest roles in everything from Blue Healers, Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, The Letdown, Please Like Me, It's a Date, Offspring, Mr. and Mrs. Murder, Outland, Slide, The King, Curtain and Newstopia. She's also performed leading roles for the Melbourne Theatre Company, Black Swan Theatre Company and Playbox Theatre. Her film roles include Cheryl in the Australian classic Muriel's Wedding, The Dish and How to Please a Woman. Her own solo shows have toured internationally and she's also been nominated for the best show at the Perth Fringe Festival the Golden Gibbo at Melbourne International Comedy Festival and Best Female Performance at the Dublin Fringe Festival. As a writer, some of her credits include Home and Away, It's a Date, Little Lunch, Skit House, Eric, Small Tales and True. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot, such as happiness and joy, grief and death, mental health, yoga and meditation, gratitude, the benefits of tapping, having a panic attack on stage, being a journey woman actor, defining ourselves and how the universe works for us, plus plenty more. Before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure. So check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5pm Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway... Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. Actually, this could be a very interesting place to start. I have a bone to pick with you. Oh. <laughs> <It doesn't look laughs> I read in an article many years ago, many moons ago, that you don't define yourself as a comedian, and I was shocked. Has that changed over the years? No, because in my head, a comedian is a stand-up. Uh and I think in the States they use the term more loosely, as in a comic performer. Yep. But here I would just call myself an actor who does more comedy than, to this point, uh, more comedy than drama, but certainly not a comedian. Because, you know, I have a lot of stand-up friends and I think they would be like, they would see that as their territory. It's very interesting. You have done, didn't you do Thank God You're Here? Yes. And you've also been nominated for an award at 
at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, which is comedy. So you're going to have to <laughs> speak through this because you are definitely a comedian in my eyes. Yes, but you know, I no, I I, I think I'm definitely a comic actor. Okay. We'll agree to disagree. Uh, we will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting with defining oneself and a lot of the actors have had a very interesting take where when they were first starting, they couldn't pronounce the world that they were actors and it had to be after a certain amount of gigs or they got a big job, then they could be an actor. But as you know, in the Australian industry, it's tough and you've probably got the largest credits in Australia and that's no joke. And You're very humble, so you're not going to respond to that. Do you remember when you could announced to the world that you're an actor was it hard for you was it easy do you have a no that was it was really tough and I think it was maybe when I got to my 30s even so I, I graduated drama school at 21 and like everyone had you know the real ups and downs like huge amounts of unemployment I mean just huge and huge um but I think when I got to my 30s and there's that natural attrition rate where people who have been in it for a while then decide you know, oh, well, I'm never going to own a house. What if I have family? You know, yeah. all those things that come into play. A scary play, yeah. So then all these people leave the industry. And I think at that point I thought, oh, I'm clearly in this for the long haul. And I think it was then that I s sort of started saying, I'm an actor, this is what I do. Because I just thought if you're in it, there was some study done that if after seven years of drama school you're still doing it, you're probably going to keep doing it. Because after seven years of drama school, there seems to be a very massive drop-off because you've given it a bloody good shot and if nothing's happening, get out. Why seven years? That's an oddly specific number. It was, wasn't it? It was just part of a longitudinal study of people, I think, out of RADA or something in the, in the early 2000s. Very, very interesting. And were there ever the doubts at that stage? I know that you got a big break quite early on-ish in the scheme of things, but... Was there ever the plan B or I'm going to do this? Or? Oh, my God, so many plan <laughs> Bs. <laughs> and my dad used to have this thing where he'd always go, come back and enroll in accounting. Come uh, back and enroll in accounting. And Although that was <laughs> never going to be on the cards because I failed maths miserably. Um, I did – I was always kind of keeping an eye out for if I could have a side hustle that become, could become the main hustle. Yeah. So I think even at 40, I, I left the biz for a while thinking I was going to concentrate on my personal training and yoga. Um, but then, you know, a gig lured me back in. And I think the thing about my career is that I've just had enough. And even though they're sometimes just three days on a gig, it's enough to just kind of keep you in. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of your soul. It really, it's part of me now, for sure. Well, you know, as we're, uh, well, you basically said it, it's a very tough industry, Australia. There's not that many gigs around and you've pretty much done every like mainstream thing that's been going on and that's still crazy to me. I'm just wondering, did you think that when you were first starting out that you would have all of these wonderful opportunities and be one of the like premier names in, in Australia? Well, thank you for that. I don't know that that's <laughs> entirely true, but thank you. But I, I think I always used to look at people's careers you know, like those actors, you know, I grew up watching Cop Shop and there was heaps of Australian content when I was a kid. So there was a country practice, there was Cop Shop. Like our week was filled with mm. Australian television as a family that we used to watch. And you'd see all these people on it that were kind of journey people actors, as in jobbing actors that would pop up on everything but seem to have long and stellar careers. And I just always wanted that. I always wanted to be one of those people that, popped up in everything. Maybe you didn't know their name, but they always kind of delivered and convinced you. And, and you know, that as, you know, it's harder to do now in Australia because there's so much less serial television and stuff that you can do guest roles on, which is how we kind of in the 90s earned, earned a living. Yeah. Um, but I think that was what I kind of set out to be was a real... Uh, journey person actor who a jobbing actor who just popped up in everything everything <laughs> <laughs> that was my aim and so what i find that's really awesome to you but what i find so fascinating is you know the doubts and the journeys of getting to this stage because 
not many people get there's literally like i don't know a handful of people that have been able to be in the industry for what probably 25 years plus yeah oh. i think it's close to 30 now wow congratulations Thank and you. even you know you've you've spoken kind of about the highs and lows and now it's a lot harder when you were going through those doubts and your dad saying do accounting did that like play on your mind when you were like telling people you're an actor or you're a PT and then an actor or you're an actor that does PT? What was? Well, because I think because of trying to have a journey person career, when you speak to people who aren't in the business, I would just never say I was an actor because otherwise they'd go, what have you been in? <laughs> and then you're listing and people go, nope, haven't seen nope. it, nope. And it just gets so awkward. Yep. So I used to just, yeah, put it as a second. Oh, and I also do some acting. You know, but I would say what, you know, that I was a PT first and foremost. That it's wild. I've I've heard this so many times, and it can be quite a. It can impact one's self esteem and confidence, where they're literally going off a list. You're like, but, but that, that, that was such good work. And then they say this. Was it? Did you just get to a point where I can't deal with it, or you just didn't want to have those conversations? A, yeah, a little bit of both. Mm. And then it used to get really embarrassing when I'd have to go back and say, oh, well, you, you might not. I, I did a film, you might know, called Muriel's Wedding because it's gotten so far away. Like it's nearly 30 years since Muriel's Wedding. But oh, sometimes yeah. that would be the only thing that people go, oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so it always used to be a, a secondary. Do you remember the first time you were maybe noticed or someone goes, I remember you from this? I don't remember the f- first time. But occasionally it happens where you do actually genuinely have a familiar face. And I remember one time this woman saying to me, no, you, and I'm saying, oh, well, yeah, actually I'm an actor. And she went, no, you went to John 23rd. I was like, oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's so good. Like, yeah. We, um, one of my friends is a very famous YouTuber and TikTok, TikToker here in Melbourne. And one person came up to me and went, oh, my God, it's you. And I was like, oh, it's the podcast. You wouldn't know about any of my screenwritings. Yeah, you recognised me from a podcast. That's really weird. How would they recognise my face because this is mainly audio? I was like, oh, it's so good to hear you. And he's like, oh, you were in one of Darren Levy's videos. And I went, oh, yeah, I don't ever remember being in it. And he remembered <laughs> me from this guy who's done probably – he's one of my best friends in amazing content, by the way. And he's probably done like a 1,000 videos, and he remembered me. And I was thinking, oh, finally, someone's recognised me from the podcast. And – the ego went straight down. <laughs> the confidence was low, but good for him. So yeah. I resonate with that. Can can be tough. Um, I also find it really interesting that through your experience of being a PT that you actually did a show about it. What yeah. brought that about? Why did you decide to do that? As a comedian, I'm putting it out there. <laughs> because I think I, I'd always worked in women's gyms. In um, There was this massive franchise in the – early 2000s, I think, worldwide, which is called Curves, which was just for women. It was a 30-minute workout and it encouraged all women of all shapes and sizes that you could just come and um, be in this safe environment and work out, get fit. And it was just a fabulous job and I loved it. And I just loved what occurred in the space of, you know, being a gym, people are very vulnerable, people have their own, you know, Brings up a lot of stuff. So as a PT, you are often listening to stories and because psychologists. And yeah, there's yeah. a lot of lot of exchange, a lot of vulnerability in people, and in that kind of group setting, because people just dropped in at any time, but it was in a big circle. So you sort of chatted and things like that. And I just thought that that was such a wonderful basis for a story, and the fact that I love playing characters. So I thought I would play six characters in 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 a class and, um, yeah, weave a narrative around all the women's stories, why they were there and and kind of the friendships that developed because I saw that time and time again at at the gyms that I worked at. That is such a good idea for a show as well, but did you ever consider writing it as a TV show? I did. I, I think the thing about TV is having known so many people who've taken so many years out of their lives to not get things up. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. I just thought one woman show, bang, it could be on next week. <laughs> <laughs> it could still work in this day and age. It could still work in this day and age, absolutely. 
Yes. I think you've had some colleagues on the show, but I think they were waiting like years to get a show made and then they wouldn't even know if season two would get made. And yeah. I had another lady on the podcast, I think she sold, someone will correct me, but let's just say 10 to 15 screenplays and not one were made. Wow, yeah, really? Isn't that, like I pour my heart and soul, I'm just about to hopefully get one made now, my first one. Yay. And... The thought of it not getting made crushes me, but now times that by 10, it'd be brutal. And even if it reverted to her after whatever kind of option period, it would feel so tainted and so, oh, that's really savage. I know, but I want you to keep it. Is she in the States or here? States. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But in America, it's very different from what I'm aware of. You can sell an idea there. In Australia, you correct me if I'm wrong because I don't know anything about the Australian industry. It needs to be like fully formed. You know, you've got your pilot, you've got your documents. That's how I hear shows get made. But in America, it's like, it's a flying shark. Like, we love it. Here's a million dollars. Yeah. yeah. It's very bizarre. I think that's, yeah, pretty true. Maybe really, we'll just... that flying shark does sound great, <laughs> yeah. by the way. Is that At your movie? Gym? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> the gym's, the, yeah, the flying shark's the trainer. Yes. You know what? This is only going to be funny to me. But I, I like to go to the movies probably every two weeks with my girlfriend. And we're like, there's no good movies coming out. And I saw the most, it actually made me somewhat scared and also excited to hopefully get movies or TV shows out there. Because like, if this can get made, then maybe my stuff can get made. It's called Cocaine Bear. And it's about a bear that just, (laughs) (laughs) and it was just like, out of the, look, I haven't seen it. I just saw the trailer. Like this is, and it wasn't a comedy. It's just about a bear that goes on a rampage because it had so much cocaine. Like, I think there's hope for me. <laughs> but have you seen Triangle of Sadness yet? Yes. Isn't that the greatest yes. movie ever? Yes. What is you? What were your takeaways? Oh my goodness! I thought it was an absolute masterpiece. So many different themes. It felt like three different movies in a sense, didn't it? And then the more you kind of went away and just thought, what it, what is it saying about the current world? And then you go right back to that first scene and kind of unravel the onion and go, oh, that's such clever. Clever filmmaking. I know. It's, when I see a show like that, I'm like, mm, I'm not as smart as them. But the, the way that they layer the themes is – because that first thing, like, what's going on here? And then it all comes back. I think that's mass, like you're a master storyteller if you can weave things like that. Same. So that's, that's going to be in your next PT TV show. <laughs> With – so you, you got this – we'll go back to that. So you got this idea. You, you know, you're meeting a lot of people. You're hearing their stories of vulner- – uh, they're being vulnerable and you're like, this is a great idea. Did you have to – did you, like, use them or you just got, like, the idea of no, them? Yeah. No, I I use composites of people, obviously, you know, um, traits and, you know, quirks and vocal patterns maybe, but nobody's story. Um, I created the story and then, yeah, and then worked from there. Very creative of you. Was this the first show that you've put up by yourself or had you done individual shows? No, before? I had done um, – I had done one previously about five years beforehand um, and I had taken that round to – taken that to the Dublin Fringe and then to Glasgow Comedy Festival. Um, ah, there we uh, are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just loved it and done big regional tours where you just arrive in a town with a suitcase, meet the sound person who's going to you oh, know, be your like tech that. and then bang, you're on stage in a big hall. I just – I found that great fun. And what made you not continue? You said there was a four or five year gap. Uh, in between that, I had quite a bit of TV work, and and you know, so that that kind of took over. And then after that, through the last tour of Jim and Tonic, I had had a bit of anxiety, and I think I was also maybe mid forties, and I just, I just thought, you know, I just had one of those epiphanies and like, well, I've done. I've done this now. Oh, so it's like a tick off the box. I'm proud of this. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and f- if I came up with another idea, like tomorrow, if I suddenly thought, oh my God, this would make a great one person show, I, I would totally do it. But I've got to say nothing has presented itself in the oh, last so, couple of years. Oh, so that's great. It's like more of an accomplishment, not a fear base. Like, oh, I don't want to do it again. It's, you know, I feel satisfied in what I did. Yeah. I told the stories I wanted to tell that I felt very passionate about you know, taking to the stage and, yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, never saying never because if I get a great idea, I will certainly get back out there. But 
and you know maybe um you know the challenges and stuff of middle age i mean there is lots of stuff to explore you know parents dying and things like that but maybe it wouldn't be in a comedy festival <laughs> Well, well, maybe I've, it would. I've seen a lot of shows, and we were talking about this off air, that do explore these topics of like grief and death, and they present it. You know, there's still the inverted commas, the serious aspect, but there's the storytelling, and there's jokes, or there's comedy when it comes through. And looking at it through a comedy lens can actually make these inverted commas taboo topics more presentable and easy to digest. And that's yeah, how that's I very learn. True. Yeah. So we're also and there's so much comedy in death. I agree. You know, yep. it's just like, yeah, the very messiness and busyness of life and death is just rich fodder. People's behaviour is yeah, it's ch- It changes people and I've been learning through other cultures how they experience death and it's completely different to, let's say, a Western point of view. And we, through my humble experience, we have a very, I don't know if strange is the right word, word we just don't understand death and we probably never will but we just we don't know how to respond if someone's going through grief and just we just don't know how to we don't know how to talk about it we're terrified of it we have so many walls and barriers and yeah yeah it's people really don't like to discuss it or their own mortality it's very interesting um many 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 years ago my uncle like passed away and and uh, and I I find this funny. This is this is not a pity party. And I'll be like, oh, you know, my uncle passed away. And they're like, oh yeah. So how uh, the footy? Did you did you watch the footy? And that would happen so much. And after a, a point, I was like, this is really funny. How people can't. I was I was okay with it. I accepted it. And people just couldn't get on. It just. What if we see raw emotion? Yeah. What if was, he breaks down? <laughs> he's not a man. <laughs> but it, but even. The females were obviously better, but I didn't analyze it through those lens. It was just very interesting. And then through my years where people talk about, you know, maybe loved ones passing away or that they're not doing well, it would be a complete shift in tone. And I've always, yeah. I haven't, I haven't been able to quite be able to express it, but my goal is to hopefully be able to have a proper conversation where appropriate and not be like, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, cool. Uh, yeah. You know, people just kind of like shut off and. If you, you, you navigate this how you want, I know that you've just gone through a really tough time as well. And the example you gave, if you don't mind me sharing, is how that you were experiencing, um, what was it, like nightmares or, yeah, nightmares where you were very worried about what, one of your loved ones passing away. Then when it happened, it was a completely different experience to you. And I, I've still been thinking about it since we spoke about this off air. I find that really interesting how you were able to like kind of shift the lens of your perception of the grief and the death, and I think also because I, um, my parents are in Western Australia, and I've lived in Victoria a long time, yep. and so there's always been that terrible fear of you know you do the count back of how's the soonest I can get anywhere if I'm suddenly required like yep. that used to keep me up at night. Yep. It takes an hour ten to get to the airport. You know, doing all the maths. Should you someone go get on a plane? You've got however however long and it, and I really used to and and you know I've gone away for a lot of jobs in the last couple of years and the first thing is always the equation of if mum or dad needed me how quickly could I get back to them thankfully I was back in town back in WA two weeks before dad died but even so I got a call at four fifteen in the morning saying wow. get mum get to the hospital they've just called and so racing to my mum's bedroom and she had just come out of hospital herself. It was just this terrible time and just trying to go, we got to go, we got to go quickly. And she's very, uh, she wasn't so able. But just in that moment, how everything, like the adrenaline and everything becomes so ratcheted down your focus of just like, bang, we're going, driving through the city. And it's like nothing that you could ever, you know, the, the, the traffic all parted. I got a rock star car park. We got up. We got 10 minutes with dad before he died. Oh, wow. And so it was this beautiful... Um, universe is working for you. U- universe is working for you. And in actual fact, in thinking, oh, I hope there's no pain. I hope he's comfortable. All those things. He was comfortable and he took a breath and then, and then he just didn't take another one. Wow. And it was... 
almost anticlimactic in its beauty and its softness and its gentleness and the calmness and the uh, yeah, I I feel really grateful that it happened like that. I am grateful, and I think he would be really grateful that it all ended like that because he had great fear about dying. Yep. That's you know, he had great yeah. fear that it would be um, painful and horrendous and, you know, something awful. And so I feel high five, Dad, that you just went on such a really warm, comfortable, soft way. How nice is that? And also your perspective of seeing it because that is – not to underplay it, extremely stressful. There's a lot of emotions that go through. Um, your mum's obviously been married to him for a long time. Just so much emotions, but you're smiling about And this is quite recent and it's, it's beautiful to hear that just the magnificence of life. And unfortunately, that's a reality of life. But you're smiling and talking about like the beauty and how the world worked for you and it parted like the, the Dead Sea. Very unique perspective and I'm also like talking about grateful, which I, w- I want to hear your definition of gratefulness. And I'm grateful to hear a perspective of that because very few people, and it's not a judgment towards anyone, don't quite have that reality. They see it as the worst thing in the world and how could someone take this man from me? But you seem to I mean, he had to go. Yeah. He had to go. It's that, isn't it, Link? Just, you know, so grateful that at the time it, he went softly. I mean, he was 86. He had to go. Lifespan is a lifespan. We can't, you can't fight progress. <laughs> you know, you, that is just an inevitability. That has just got to, you've got to get your heads around that. We've just, we just have to get our heads around it, don't we? I, I very much agree with you. And we were talking about the book, um, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And you've also done a lot of meditation and yoga. And we'll talk about that. And I'm sure that's given you a more comfortable feeling around death and grief. But, just hearing these stories about regrets, for example, and just seeing people at the end of their journey. I don't even know where I'm going with this, but has, has that experience, I'll tie it in <laughs> later, but has that experience with um, seeing your father go in that way, has that changed you for the better or the worse or is it too early? Well, I think it would be for the better. And I think the thing is when you, you know that they say that the sound is the last sense, Yep. That goes so that even if someone has passed, the, you know, even when the breathing stops, that there is still an element that they can hear for a, some period of time afterwards. So talking and, you know, we made sure that we were saying lovely things. Oh, nice. And it really does just come down to what you would say, what I did say, and I think what you would want to hear is, thank you, I love you. You know, but it, but it really was thank you. Thank you for, you know, thank you for being my dad. Thank you for being amazing. I love you so much. Go gently. You were the best. You know, just this kind of running monologue of, uh, and that's all it boiled down to. Like, I, I am grateful that you were in my life and go gently. You were loved. I felt loved by you, you know. That's what we all want. Yeah, and that's everyone it, wants isn't that. it? I think he would give you that high five. Yeah. That's, that's so beautiful and this idea of uh, gratitude, I did some sneaky um, stalking and a lot of your posts on Instagram, you would always hashtag gratitude or grateful. Why? Well, how irritating of me. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag blessed. Um, no, no, I, I do think... It. I love it. I do think, you know, and studies are done that a, that a gratitude practice is actually, you know, profound in, in many I, ways. I do them. So I think, yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. I, I kept a gratitude journal for ages, the three things every day. And, and I often start a yoga class with gratitude because it just, because there is always something to be grateful for. And we can get so caught up in the minutiae of all the nitty gritty of the day that has not gone right. And yet, and I often say, even if you are just grateful for a smile from a barista in the morning, that is something you know, that has elevated your spirit, that has lifted you out of um, an egocentric or a kind of a, a an inward focus that, it, you know, I think, you know, there is always something to be grateful for. And I do think that it, it, it is a profound practice to look for every day, to consciously look for things to be grateful for. You're a very conscious and, like, uplifted human being. You just, like, radiate this, like, 
love and joy. This could be a bit loaded. Have you always been like this or is it through like your yoga and your meditation and your gratitude practice and there's probably some other things that you've done? Have you had to actively work at this or is it just something that's come with progress? Yeah, I think I think I've tr- you know tried to do a lot of work and I um what do they say no matter how far down the spiritual path you think you are go and spend time with your family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and having just spent 10 weeks with my family uh. Occasionally I thought, oh, man, all these years of yoga and meditation have mounted to nothing. I can be triggered and fly off the handle and be an absolute little brat. Um, So, you know, we're all a work in progress, aren't we? (laughs) That is a great way and a horrible realisation for me because I, when I get back, I'm like, oh. I know. You just have to take some deep breaths. It's all in the breathing. Yes. All in the breathing. So how did you discover yoga meditation, gratitude, or the gratitude practice? Family, is it something that you discovered on your own? Well, mum was a yoga teacher in the 70s. Oh, interesting. So she used to, we lived in the country in Western Australia, and she used to have the local ladies over on a Monday night and would um, teach a class in the lounge room. And it was just the best night of the week because not only would we pull all the furniture out of the lounge room and play this great game in the hallway because you have to just... Show me like yeah. Tetris. Yeah. yeah. But I could hear her dulcet tones through the door and she had candles and so we had that kind of beveled glass. Ooh. And you could just see the flicker of candles and very soft music and there was something so appealing about it. It just seemed like the... This, this lounge room had turned into this incredible charlotte, this sanctuary. Um, and I think that kind of stayed with me. And then as a late teenager, it took till that long for me to start taking sort of That's weekly pretty, classes and then short, becoming though. more regular. That's normally, and I know you've got a beautiful relationship with your parents, normally when our parents do these things where you want to run away or not want to do it or we think it's crazy just because our parents are doing it. So even doing it in your early teens or late teens, that's still pretty – so you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, long time. Wow. And But I was just a a once-a-week person for years and years. It's once a week's better than – I get get it a lot. Even people have been messaging me about like meditation and yoga through the podcast and doing's better than not doing. So if you can do it once a week then. Oh, my goodness. A two-minute meditation practice. If that's all you're doing, bang. I had a gentleman, Luke Darcy, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, and for the non-Australians, he one of the better AFL players. Yes. And he's now in the media and a really awesome guy. He is so like passionate and pro about meditation and yoga and wellness, and I couldn't believe it coming from the AFL space. And he was saying like 20 minutes, I think he does two 20 minutes Yeah, in the morning and night. And he said that if he hasn't slept well, even just the 20 minutes of meditation feels like a few hours for him. And Totally does. Yeah, I totally agree. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, I know. I was was very intrigued. Yes, and I'm a big Luke Darcy fan, so that's excellent. I do for the Western Bulldogs. Yeah. He's also very conscious and aware human being and very, when like he looks at you, he's an extremely present individual. But you don't normally associate AFL with the wellness. Like obviously they're very fit people, but he's... Very aware. I think he's got a wellness TV show. He does, yeah. House, yeah. Of, house of Wellness, in fact. Yes. Well, yes. I don't know if it's out, but people check it out. So from the meditation and yoga side, when did you realise that you actually wanted to teach it? While I was being a PT, so I was being a personal trainer, and I kind of thought, why am I doing this when really my my own practice is so um, so important to me? And it's so fundamental to who I think I am. Why don't I go and teach that instead of being a PT? Because I was doing less and less sort of training of myself, you you know, weights and PT land. Um, So I thought, why not, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Go and learn this. Go and teach this. Very cool. Yeah. And that absolutely has been just the best thing I ever did. I would also imagine, because you're also working as a yoga teacher as well, and you do so many other things as well does that also take away from the pressure of acting as well yeah and now i'm like i don't get bent out of shape when i'm not working as an actor because i love my life as a yoga teacher equally like i really 
I have finally, after 30 years of trying to look for a side hustle that I loved, I have found one that, nice. that I absolutely love. I think it's, it's really good advice because from the acting side, and I'm not an actor by any means, but I'd love to be in people's TV shows and movies, so hit me up. <laughs> and <laughs> the idea of like waiting for the phone call, that's scary. It's so <laughs> tedious. And I would imagine when you're first starting out, it's... You know, oh, the mobile. answering machine. Yeah, oh, yeah. my God. I would just not leave the flat waiting for a call or you'd leave and then you'd come out, you'd check the answering machine and wait for that little red light to blink. I mean, that was just a hell of a... That sounds so unbelievably stressful. So and, stressful. And also to completely unground one as well. Because even if you're out, you're like, oh, I need to go back, I need to go That's back. That's it. You'd always... Yeah. And then you'd open the door and it wouldn't be blinking. <laughs> That would be a huge whirlwind of emotions. Did you have any like techniques or how did you manage to like block that out? No, but I do have a good, um, what happened like just back in the non-mobile phone day was I had the call back for Muriel's wedding on a Friday, flew to Sydney, this big day of workshops. They were pairing up uh, all these girls to be what would end up being the group of bridesmaids. So they oh, had cool. different variations. Okay. I was, did it sort of lots of improv and then I thought I hadn't gone well and I stayed with my sister and I cried all weekend wow. and I eventually got back to Melbourne on the Monday blinking light a call had come in on the Friday and I got the <laughs> gig but because of my, no mobile phones um, oh. I'd spent the whole weekend crying just being a pain in the bum not moving off my bed just going i've messed up this job this job would have been amazing and i'd got home and the message had come in on friday isn't that you know we gave the example before a more extreme version but where we think a situation has gone a certain way and then we're only looking through a small lens and then we look the other way and an amazing opportunity that probably has changed your life for the good yeah that's right did you think you just never know? <laughs> I know, and that's the beauty when in my small moments of being able to do this and let go, that's when I've allowed some amazing experiences in my life. But in that moment where you're crying and you know you're mourning potentially not getting the role, did you ever think you got it or you think you'd butchered it so oh, badly? Oh, I thought I butchered it so badly. That to me is so interesting that you obviously did such a good job, but maybe uh, Please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if these are the right words. Maybe you're thinking like you're a perfectionist, so you could have done better. But you actually did such a good job in your way that they still liked it. But maybe it wasn't of a standard, or what was going on in your mind? Because you obviously did a good job. And I think the, the girl that I was up against for the same role had a quite a big TV profile at the time. So I think as well, you know, I was out of drama school. I had no, not many credits, and so I think that had overwhelmed me as well. Ah, I think. Yes. I just assumed that, well, you know, she's going to get it because she's been on the telly. Hey, um, any like SMSs or left a voicemail? I got it. <laughs> <laughs> None of that. But isn't that also interesting? And, and I completely understand it. But in this industry, there's that element of you, one might be better for the role, but this person's got either more credits or they're more well known. And that's what gets a show going. And I understand that and I'm not naive and I understand that there's money in this business, but it still kind of blows my mind with that type of stuff. Like you can do such a good job and they're like, mm, you're just not as famous as the next that's person. That's right. And Australia's really, really bad for that. Really oh, bad for just putting like the same 10 people in everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of your age group, you can, you know, yeah. they're the top actors who get. That's why when you're in, you're in. But yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, the pool is, the jobs just aren't, there are just aren't enough jobs for, or maybe just people just don't take risks, but it's so frustrating. It's, I would, it, there's, there's probably a positive lesson there that if you're good to work with and you're easy and you can actually perform a role, then you're like, inverted commas, secure, whatever that means. Yes. Not that I'm saying you're not whatsoever, but you've been doing all of these, you've, you've been that those 10 people in all these different roles. But it's still like, it seems like less risk-taking from my totally. outset view. Absolutely. Absolutely less risk-taking. And, may, you know, whether that's funding bodies, whether that's, you know, whatever it might be to secure a project. I mean, you do hear that um, 
some things. We just need someone, you know, to take to Screen Australia. We just need one name that Screen Australia will go, oh. Yes, we're um, in. So what's the, like, this is what I'm finding very hard. You know, I'm the naive artist. I just want to make my project. I Money's not a concept. I'm not this bad, but just, <laughs> I just want to get it made. And then there's people that would be like, well, we need to do this, we need to do this, or this is too time consuming or t- costly. And then the money creeps in and you have to kind of, not that I'm doing it at this stage or with any other previous project, but now you have to potentially write with the budget. You can't do that. And then that could potentially take away, not that I'm at that level yet, but that could potentially take away from the artist's journey when you're yeah. now looking through money lens. Yeah, and I think as an artist you should never look through the money lens. Lens That is the producer's job. Yeah. So I think, yeah, because, uh, you know, how curtailed, how hamstrung would you be if you're thinking – well, we'll just set it in one room. <laughs> <laughs> Not to say that that wouldn't be amazing, but, you know, you, you would be, you know, round peg, square hole. That's the expression of square peg, round hole. I think that's it. <laughs> but I, 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 I understand. And it is still, and I know there's producers and other people and executives, but it's still interesting that that kind of like floats in. When you were starting, yeah. obviously you wanted to support yourself and – be rich and famous. No, I'm just joking. But you wanted to be able to do this for as long as you wanted That's to. That's it. As long and as you want to. And then these other voices creep in. Has it been a journey with you? Has it been something that you understood or was there like a pushback on any of that stuff or have you always been very removed from that side? I think, you know, like we were saying before as to why I didn't write ideas into TV shows is because – the thing about doing something live is that you are in control and you can just get it up way quicker. Yes. So I have very successful producer and TV writer friends, but frankly that has never appealed to me. It looks so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I really admire what you're doing for pursuing it because I just think, um, you know, it is a it is a tough gig and what you really need is just, Find that producer who's going to have your back. I think finding the little team, the team when you're the writer, that's the go, isn't it? Because then, you know, because as creatives, we don't necessarily have great producer ba- brains. And I, yeah, you know, I certainly don't. Um, um, I mean, I sort of, I, I do in a small scale as in putting yeah. on a little show. Yeah. I can put on a little show and do the maths on that. But, but you know, to be able to approach funding bodies, to be able to approach all those people, you need someone in your corner. I would also imagine just being able to do what you've been able to do for so long, you would have had to surround yourself with, and you know, you mentioned some like successful producer friends, but even like acting friends, maybe comedy friends, you would have had to be in an environment where you can bounce ideas off or discuss things. Yeah. Do you have a strong support system or have you had one over the years of? Yes. Service? Yeah. Ooh, so more. I, um, yeah. So I have uh, Bob Franklin who as like my best friend in the universe uh, great comedian, great writer, great actor, great human being, and just my absolute ride or die, and has been since we met in 1993. In fact, on a job, so I did Eric, Eric Banner's sketch show, uh, and on that job I met Stephen Curry, Robin Butler, and Bob Franklin, and they are still, like, part of my... That's beautiful. Yeah, Ones I love dearly. And then Emily Tahini, who's a who's a very, very close friend. I met her mad as hell. So I do have lots of lasting friendships that have come through jobs. And I think it's when you're a creative, having a creative posse is kind of the, the greatest thing. And also just to keep us like grounded and, you know, emotions come into play, not working for whatever moment or you didn't get the job because your hair colour is not blonde That's, enough or... Yeah, and it, and then people know where you're at. They, you know, they're in the same boat and then, you know, it's, uh, it's very unifying. And I think the fact that everyone's careers are going pretty well, um, but we all still have long periods of like, oh, man, was that the last one? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's the acting curse. Yeah. And how so. have you been able to, because as we said, there's the moments of... I mean, no work. There's the no's. There's the brutal rejections or you spend so long maybe auditioning or just you think something's going to get made and it doesn't get made or they change the 
cast for whatever. I know your support system would help you with that. Are there anything? How have you been able to navigate that? That is the worst part of the of the biz. I think just through sheer longevity and getting older is you just know eventually something will come up again. Like it just will. If you just – and that was the whole thing about my career and wanting to be a journey person acting was if you just hang in there long enough, like if you hang in there till you're 30 and then all those women go and have babies, if you just keep hanging in and then if you hang in till you're 40 and people can't bear looking older on camera and then if you just hang in till you're 50 and, you know, I just – I'm just going to keep hanging in there because eventually the you know the pool gets smaller. I like that it's like this resilience and perseverance. We're also underselling that yoga and through my experience yoga and meditation massively will help Massive. with the nervous system, calming one down, change perspective. That's just three points of probably 200,000 that you could bring up. Absolutely. And just very long story short, that before I did this, I wasn't as equipped to maybe deal with my emotions or be able to see the world from a different lens. So I would imagine this has really helped you. I'm not saying it's the reason that you've been able to do everything that you're doing, but it would really probably help ground you and challenge you in a positive way. Absolutely. And fundamental to the way I live my life. Can you expand Absolutely. on that? Well, I just think... You know, if you try and have a daily sadhana practice, a, a daily practice of study into yogic tradition and, you know, so I will always. <laughs> I've never used this before. <laughs> that was my alarm. So always having a, um, you know, having a regular meditation practice, having a regular yoga practice, having a regular pranayam breathing practice and just trying to every day read something non-fiction based around yoga, the yogic tradition or, you know, the philosophy or something that I'm – or Buddhist philosophy, you know, something that I'm interested in just that you would every day take in some piece of information that would, you know, hopefully build a better life, build a better, more empathetic life, you know, be a better human expand your consciousness as well yeah. different way of thinking and so were if you don't mind me asking were your parents of that philosophy of close to buddhism or were they more christian or were they non-religious no or? so um grew up pretty catholic uh yes no dad had a very strong catholic faith in fact his funeral was all the catholic bells and whistles and i am um, I am not a Catholic. I have not identified as Catholic for a very long time, but bloody hell, I knew every response. <laughs> <laughs> My mouth opened. I could sing the hymns. I, I knew everything. I thought, isn't that funny? All that You don't sit in church every Sunday for 16 years and not absorb a lot. Yes, I went to a Jewish school and I don't know anything. Like, I literally don't know anything. And then occasionally when we're at a wedding, so I'm like, oh, how do I know that? Or, yeah. that's crazy. It's still stiff. Uh, somewhere yeah. back in that filing yeah. cabinet. Get it away. Get it away. <laughs> <laughs> and was was that a challenge? The comp Not necessarily conflict. So there's a lot of um, positive uh, interlap. There is a lot of positive. I mean... The Catholic Church is an institution I find entirely problematic, but Christianity as a basis, no problem. Yep. So, it, yeah, it is the the institution that, um, you know, that I find challenging, but certainly there's so many parallels. Yeah. Oh, that's the one. I just can't, can't yeah. speak English. And it's quite a journey in itself, and everyone I've spoken to, and we can probably do 10 podcasts on this, but just the, the way of thinking has completely changed my perspective and made me more relaxed but more importantly be able to hopefully not all the time empathize with someone and be able to see where they're coming from and so now not all the time when i've got a lot of work to do I'm not perfect but i'm able to react much less it's and, so true isn't it yeah yeah so there's that idea that between stimulus and reaction there is that moment and you have that and the more that you meditate and the more that you get quiet, the more you are able to arrest the moment between the stimulus and needing to react. And so in that that millisecond before your response, as you've learned to get quiet and meditate, you have the moment to go, I'm not going to fly off the handle. I'm not going to, you know, whatever. I'm going to just take this moment, observe, have that perspicacity just for that 
beautiful moment and respond differently. And, you know, as you say, circumstances, families, (laughs) (laughs) all the triggers. But even just knowing that that exists, that there is this, this is there is this beat in the world where you could change what you're going to respond, how you're going to respond. And it's so beautiful and I don't always appreciate it in the moment but when you hear someone else talk about it like you, it's like a, it's a constant reminder that I'm potentially on inverted commas, my right path. And do you, do you have these reminders or you're just so immersed, you know, you're just going to be able to do it or have you had these little bits where they're like, oh, I need to go back to my yoga meditation or I need to meditate a bit longer or any of these? Or oh, you- so, so many. And as I say, just the very challenging aspects of, you know, grief and family and all of that. I, I, and I feel so grateful, that word again, but just going, I have a place. I have the refuge of my yoga mat. You know, like safe there space. is a such a safe space in the world that I, I I closed my um, yoga class the other day by saying, you know, may your mat always be a refuge for you, because I just think if you if if you know that you can come to your mat and it it meet you where it finds you, and you know for all your age and all your stage and whatever's going on, that if that can you know be a safe space and support you, time to wake up. Um, yeah, that I think we are. Very lucky. And you just want everyone to have that. You just want everyone to have a place where they can. And just to get rid of the the stresses of the day as well. Yeah. Just very interesting. And you mentioned this before, and I have in my notes as well, that you suffered from anxiety. And I assume that these came into play, uh, like yoga, meditation, PT, and that probably has changed your relationship. Or was this afterwards? I... It, when you're doing the shows. Yeah, so it was at the – during the show and what had happened was I had I had nearly choked. I had nearly choked on something and I had really hurt my throat and then I got what's known as oh, – I think it's called hysterica vulgaris or something, is that then I became very fearful of swallowing. Interesting. And I kept thinking I was going to choke and – I had gone on stage, and you know how sometimes you just, um, I don't know whether it was air or just a little bit of saliva or something, but on stage, I just froze and thought, I'm going to choke, but there was nothing in my mouth. (laughs) It was just saliva, but, you know, the, the fear response, absolutely, I just went into fight or flight. I heard ringing in my ears, my breath, so I just sort of had a panic attack on stage thinking I was going to just choke on a little bit of saliva, but obviously it wasn't about the choking. It was just my body had this response and then I couldn't, you know, work through it. And, you know, I was a, uh, I was a yogi at that stage. I, w- I was a regular practicer and a regular meditator, so it didn't necessarily stop me from having that, but it has certainly helped me work through that and be able to know that, you know, you will often think you're going to choke, but you're probably not going to choke. You're just going to breathe and you're going to relax and you're going to hold the moment, consciously slow down your breath and then try and swallow. You know, I have a very extreme view of when we experience these things, this is just from my perspective, don't mean to attack anyone, that there's a potentially an unhealed response within us and it's something that we need to look into if one chooses to. And I think you mentioned in one of the articles I read that you did EMDR yeah. and tapping. Tapping. I'm a massive tapper. Please blurt it all out. Are you a tapper? Um, I am aware of it. I've studied kinesiology, so there's a aspect of it, but not quite probably what you know. But again, working on the somatic body. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yes, tapping has absolutely changed my life. That is one of the fundamentals of my mental health toolkit for oh, sure oh yes. yeah like absolutely so uh tapping for those of you who don't know is um emotional freedom technique and it's using the uh, same as this sort of acupressure acupuncture points to gently have a somatic response to the body so you move through these various points as you're tapping and you 
you recognize the truth of the situation that you're in. So instead of trying to suppress or deny and going, everything's fine, everything's fine, (laughs) you don't. You go, I am so nervous. I think I'm going to choke. I'm terrified of swallowing. Um, And so you'd be tap on the side of the hand. And so, but you would still have set up statements which say, but I still completely honor and respect how I feel or I still love myself or, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. And then as you tap through the points on the body which correlate with different um, acupressure, acupuncture points, as I mentioned, so you're sending a message to your amygdala to relax at the same time as you're saying the things that you fear. So so you're saying out loud what the fears are, you're addressing them, but you're also Mm -hmm. sending the message to the body that you're safe and well. And so in doing that, it's this extraordinary technique and and these days due to um an incredible uh person called dr peter stapleton up in bond university she's been doing this extraordinary research into tapping and you know the science backs it up now there just had not been enough studies on it particularly with ptsd dawson church in the u.s are doing amazing work with people with ptsd their their numbers are coming way down in terms of so good oh it's so good and so i Sorry, long rave about tapping, but no, I, no, no, I, I I just want it's, everyone to. It's such a simple tool, and we can all able, do it. And we can all do it. In my limited, oh, I don't even know if that's limited. I still do tapping, and I'm aware of some of the points. And I was following just to see. Um, I can't remember, but I went to see someone for the first time, and I can't. I think it was, anyway. Long story short, it was a huge stress, and I'm always skeptical, but not skeptical because I've done kinesiology, so I'm aware that there's a lot more out there that can work, and. I came out of there. I'm like, well, let's see how this tapping works, even with the kinesiology background. And as soon as I left, I'm like, wow, I feel like a million dollars. This is crazy, even though it's still in alignment. But, you know, I just had never heard about it and I could not believe it. And then there's been other people that I know have either studied it or done it and completely, completely different on depending on what the issue is. You can just kind of get rid of certain issues like yeah. that. And, and it has great um people with cravings and people with addictions like it has really great thank you i'm the sugar i haven't been able the to craving do. oh oh my yeah. goodness oh, okay. i think you're a great one. Oh, yeah I'm a sugar just, craving oh okay i'm so excited yeah i beat it for a bit and then it's come back i'm so excited it's yeah. my last known addiction we've all got heaps we've all got heaps yep okay that's very exciting i yeah, look forward to that and once again because that is seen as potentially even though I think it's amazing and to me it's mainstream, seen as more alternative, have you always had like kind of the lens for trying these things that aren't inverted commas that everyone like talks about and known about? Or yeah, and I think I was such a massive pothead for so long. <laughs> <laughs> that would help. <laughs> I did used to love my drugs, my recreational drugs. Um, no, just mostly pot, just a massive pothead, but, so, which I think sort of lends itself to, you know, like, medicinal marijuana you know i'm fully fully in favor of and i've just got a friend actually who's um trialing cbd oil she's got cerebral palsy and um you know which is a severe tightening of the muscles and the cbd oil is making a profound difference to her Whoa. life profound difference That's to her exciting. pain it's so exciting yeah i think um you know these things are you know welcome and to be there's a lot out there that There's we're not aware of or we haven't studied enough. Yeah. And it's I've trialed a lot of things. Some, not so much, but it depends on the practitioner as well. Sometimes yeah. you get a bad That's practitioner. True. But a lot of things I've tried that if I was to name of, people would have no idea. And it's just been unbelievable. It's just, it blows my mind what what is out there. We think we know. We think that yeah. we, we don't. And I'm constantly in or of the new discoveries of what people, their knowledge and what they yeah. can actually provide to people. Yeah. Crazy world. Crazy world. So do you remember when you first discovered tapping? Was Is there a moment? Yes. Yeah, so this was all around the choking. Oh, So yeah, this was, gotcha. yeah, yeah, as a result of the choking and then the panic attack on stage. So that was all around there. I went to, I threw everything at it. I got I, I, I'm quite a big believer in hypnosis as well. So I had been hypnotized Same. and then the person who hypnotized me introduced me to tapping and also the... The eye rotation? Yeah. Or is that... The, yeah, that's the E. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. I call it... I, we, I do another form of like eye rotations and stuff. Oh. So that's 
I'll ask you about that off air. That's very interesting. Yeah, so I'm, I'm – th- that did work for me, but the tapping, I think, was the thing that really – Yeah. And then after that, I was just like, I got I to gotta know about this tapping stuff. Ed, you navigate this how you want, and this is just your experience. We're, we're not doctors here. But I heard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that at that stage, because you're going through a lot of anxiety, that you're on antidepressants, and then a doctor gave you some interesting advice that helped you at that stage? Yes. Yeah, so this was prior to – this was early 30s when I was yep. on antidepressants – was to get fit. And the psych that I saw was a fit person and just said, you know, if you just incorporate exercise into every day, get that endorphin rush, you know, this will profoundly change your life. And Very good advice. Yes, very good advice. And, you know, and then that led me to becoming fit and then becoming a PT so I could, you know, like that's all that's how, so yeah, it all, that, so that was the late 20s probably that I was on antidepressants. And, and then got that advice and then that, that changed everything. Isn't it so nice when someone can just give simple advice and it completely – and it's not an ego-driven advice. No. It's just here's some advice. Yeah. But kind of take it or leave it and can – And I was at the right place to hear it and understand it and it was the key and it was – it changed everything. That is so beautiful to hear. I've got a thousand questions on that. I don't even know where to start. So I saw that you're also you were an ambassador for something, but oh yes, yeah. so related to tapping, which is yep. the Mind Heart Connect Foundation, which is a foundation that is sort of caring for the carer in that they go to remote communities and teach tapping to nurses and carers of remote communities. Cool. So yeah, it's taking care of the carer and um, using tapping as the primary technique i hope that the sales go up because <laughs> it's just so that's so awesome to hear and how do you even discover something like that that's because i no, they discovered me because i was talking about tapping <laughs> uh on an abc radio interview when i was promoting the heights um it was just at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, Jacinta Parsons on the ABC said, you know, how, oh, it's, what if this pandemic turns out to be a thing? It wasn't even, I didn't think it was a pandemic at that stage. Yes. And I said, oh, well, you know, I have these techniques and I'll probably tap my way through the next three years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. And, you know, tying up everything in this kind of space, um, we, we've alluded to this as well and I've I found a quote. I, f- I forget the context, but... I'd like you to tell me what this quote means to you, even though it's your quote. But it'll all work out, I figure, because the universe generally has a way of making it work out. Oh, all in divine order. I am, I really believe that. It really will all work out, and it will work out exactly as it is supposed to. I agree. In the moments of when the universe isn't working for me or I'm overthinking or the stress is coming out, why did it happen this way? Very stressful. But through when I'm able to, not all the time, take a step back and go, oh, I needed to experience that so that I can experience this. It's very hard. It's, it's hard to get there at times. It takes a lot of work. Please just ex- blurt out everything you can think about on that because – but I also think age helps with that because you've been through it enough to know that you, you've got more examples of looking back and going, well, if I had got that job, that wouldn't have happened. You know, you just have more in the reference to be able to support that notion that yeah. everything does work out as it's supposed to. So I just think that is the benefit of getting older is that you, yeah, you literally have more examples back in the files to go, yeah, I wouldn't have met them if I... We, we've had so many examples of that line of thinking and I love it. I think it's a very healthy way for me to live. One lady got fired from a job for whatever reason because of something gross. Like they didn't, one of the executives didn't think she was hot enough. Something gross. Yes, we're on the same page. And obviously that's very scary. That's unacceptable and we can throw a lot of words there. And she wasn't happy about it. But then eventually when they like, kicked her off another executive or someone I'm butchering the story a little bit said that's unacceptable why don't you come on to another project of mine and I think it was maybe even the office 
and she got a role on The Office. Wow. And she wouldn't have got The Office, or at least in that way, if she didn't, unfortunately, we're not advocating for anyone to be like that, but through a very stressful situation. And then like a few days later, a week later, whatever, she gets to The Office and now she's on. She, she got to be in an this episode of The Office. This is excellent. And I would say that almost every one of the podcasts has given an example of I'm something sure. traumatic or inverted commas perceived as a negative. But then with a bit of time, a bit of healing or a bit of, yeah, a bit of time to see the world in a different lens and how that's actually been an opportunity for them. Yeah, I think – and I do think trust is a huge element in that. I just think, um, you know, trusting the flow, the flow and the rhythm of life, I think, if you give over to that and stop fighting against that, I think you will ease the path a little. Uh, you're you're very wise. We're gonna. D- I've got one thing to tie up on that before we do a rapid fire segment. And you, you've spoken as something that's really important through my perspective is that when we're doing like the one thing and you know acting, for example, can be very stressful as we've spoken about, where we're constantly waiting for that next job. And now you've got yoga and meditation and another source of fun, a hobby slash a job as well. Has Oh, I've got so many questions on this. Has the yoga and meditation and having that second stream of income helped with the play and fun within the acting? Oh, absolutely. Ooh. Yeah, absolutely. They they definitely feed into each other. I mean, they're very complementary. I think being able to, um, you know, so, the, so that instead of approaching acting jobs with this um, grip of like, I need this because I need to make the money because I'm getting a, tiny income from you know but enough to live on on my yoga that then I can approach acting with less of a grasp less of a grip and more of just a oh wow I get to do this for a bit and so then I think that just releases lots of pressures and lots of um tension around it in that you can just um yeah approach it with more ease and more grace and more just joy for the the fundamentals of just being able to play that's that's the goal to yeah. play and have fun in what we do. And yeah. you, know, you said a lot better than me. But when we're very stressed about something, it can be very hard to see it through those lenses. That's it. You know, it's a tight a grip tight. thing. You're Loosen giving, that grip. You're giving yourself space to appreciate it and not be in a, a stressful situation. Because there's always things that we can do to mitigate stress. That's right. And you've done a fantastic example. Oh, actually, last thing before we get into the rapid fire segment. So we spoke about your big break, uh, Muriel's wedding. When you got that, what were you thinking at the time? Were you thinking you're going to be the next best superstar? Were you thinking of, like, inverted commas, finally I've got my foot through a door? Finally I've got my foot through the door. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought thought maybe I'd do more movies. It was a very long time till I was in another movie. Um. But I think at the time I really just thought, oh, I, yeah, I, I, I've got my foot in. I've got my foot in. Oh, I nice. did, everyone sort of thought the film would be big. I mean, I don't think anyone thought that it would have this sort of enduring longevity that it's had, thankfully. Yeah. But I think there was a, definitely a buzz around it. So it felt like a great job to have landed. Have you been in many jobs where you've done it and you're like, oh, this is not going to air or this isn't great or do you not ever – do you think like that or – or is this just a heightened feeling being in Muriel's wedding off that that vibe of, oh, this is pretty special? Yeah. I also think because it was one of my first jobs, I probably didn't have enough to compare it with. Yeah, but you can read the energy of it. Yeah, but you well. can read the energy. Yeah. And, and even the script on the page felt, you know, wonderful and it was written so beautifully. It's really cool. even, even the big print, you know, was yeah. just a joy to read. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I lost my train. No, no, all good. <laughs> it, in terms of when you, I've also lost my train of thought, but that's that's a good thing. That means we can pivot. Mm-hmm. So, in terms of, did you? Where have you done many jobs where you felt like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, no, not many. I mean, some you have this unfortunate thing of really enjoying on set. And then you watch it go back on telly and you're like, oh, I had too much fun on that job because <laughs> too that much was fun a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> a turkey. Yeah. Can you expect? 
Well, sometimes, you know, it's not the sum of its parts. Like yeah. you have a great vibe, it feels fun when you're doing oh, it, and then gotcha. you see the cut or something in the end, you go, oh, that didn't, you know, not, not all translate. the elements yeah. quite, yeah. Um, and then conversely, sometimes you're on a job and you just feel like, oh, my God, this is just, uh, this is brutal. This is so hard. Every element of this is hard. And then you watch the finished product and, it, you know, it is way elevated from your experience on that's good. Yeah. Do you, so, do you have criteria of what you look out for now? Uh, well, yeah, I think, I th- you know, it's got, I, I'm not just going to take a job. I, I, I'm i pretty happy with turning down jobs. You know, I don't, if it's not singing to me, I won't even audition. You know, like I, I just take a look at things and think, you know, a lot of American stuff comes through and I'm, I'm not particularly interested in telling American stories. I, you know, I am quite attached to the Australian industry and our stories. So, um, yeah, I mean, I won't take a job just for money or things like that. I won't audition for something that I don't think that I'm a good fit for or feel compelled to do. You're a true artist. Well, I hope so. Yes, you are. (laughs) You're, You're very humble. And the last thing on that, so you got your foot through your door. Did that unleash this confidence in you? Um, I Yeah, I think that then started a trajectory of after that I met someone who then said, oh, Kitty Flanagan's leaving Full Frontal. I want you to come and meet Ted Emery. I then met Ted Emery. First day on set, I met Sean McAuliffe and Eric Banner. I then went on to do Eric's show. Then I went on to do Sean's show. You know, just... Universe working for the you. The universe working for you. And like luck and timing cannot be denied. Just right place, right time. Absolutely. So what's your perspective on that? I know this can can be a very long conversation, but to be able to take the luck you still need to have prepared or do the work or be in a position to take that opportunity. Yes, that's very true. That is very true. Okay, so we just uh we um we uh, we just figured it out in <laughs> one minute. That was easy. <laughs> um I reckon what we're going to do now okay. is a quick rapid fire segment. So the first thing that springs to your mind, but you can take time to think about it if you need it. Okay. Ready to rumble? Uh-huh. Okay. I want to tie in some points as well. Okay. Where do you think you get your ideas from? My heart. I've never heard that answer before. And I'm not going to comment on that, but that was great. But I'm not, <laughs> I'll just keep on derail, derailing these things. What keeps you motivated? Um, curiosity. What's been your special ingredient to work all these years? Being easy to get along with. What's your favourite thing to do when you're not working? Uh, yoga will be with my dog. What type of dog do you have? English pointer. How old? Eight. Ooh, that's a nice age. Yeah. Um... Favourite thing about yourself? Um, my sense of humour. Do you have any regrets? No. What's your perspective on regrets? Also very loaded. Yeah, they're a slight waste of time. Yeah, you just got to keep moving forward. Next big dream or goal? Um, keep working. Keep employed eventually maybe be able to pay off my little flat. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, a book that changed your life and why? Oh, a book that changed Or maybe my a life. current one. You seem to do a lot of... Yeah. Um, I do a lot of reading. Let me think. Oh, you got me on that one. It's hmm. always hard when you say the one. Or maybe it is. Maybe that hard. springs to mind. Well, you know, they'd be the bug of... <laughs> bug of... Bhagavad Gita, of course, uh, yogic text, the uh, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. That's probably a beauty. Um, yeah, you got me on that one. I think that's pretty good. If you, I don't even know how I would answer it. So, um, <laughs> not fair. <laughs> <laughs> What's been the most embarrassing thing to happen to you on stage, or something funny? Uh, embarrassing thing. There's been a few. Uh, I did go on stage for like half a scene with 
side of my dress not zipped up and me not realising. Those kind of sort of just slightly embarrassing things. Quite embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... Oh, I think I froze a couple of times or I messed up a couple of times in Thank God You're Here, which was a very stressful job. Oh, it was? Yeah, it was a very stressful job, that one. Because, okay. Because I was behind the door. So I wasn't an, um, an improviser, but it sort of made it hard because you had lines that you had to say to propel the thing forward. Yep. But it was often a very awkward and clunky pivot. If someone had... The guest, the celebrity, had gone on this great, you know, flight of fancy, but then you had to clunkily steer them back to the script because it was quite tightly scripted. Yes. So I often felt embarrassed at the end of that because I hadn't kind of seamlessly, because it's live and everything else, and your yeah, just brain's like working the hardest it, is so it? hard. But sometimes I just artlessly yanked someone and especially when someone had been doing this great improvisation and I'd had to yank them back to a question I didn't well, really it, like if that. it makes you feel better it's my favorite show of all time is it really I think it's so good I wish they would redo that I know it. it was so it, good they should they totally should. there's so many good people now that would be amazing on it so I think I actually it's the only DVD set I I own <laughs> is of oh, thank God you're here that in it so it's it, for people that aren't aware, it's a an Australian show that is improvised, but it's also how would you describe it? Actually, you can probably describe it better than me. So it's sort of part scripted with questions for then a celebrity to improvise. So yeah. it has a framework. So I was part of the framework end of town, um, and then yeah, it lets people improvise. When you were a part of a show like that, because that would have been probably one of the biggest shows at the time, could you feel that as well? Or was it more was just stressful? Trying? Oh, it was so stressful. I think I just lived in weeks and weeks of stress and fear on that one. Interesting. Well, <laughs> yeah. from looking back at it, there it was a great show and I didn't notice any mistakes or anything like that. I thought it was the way the show was supposed to be. Yeah, luckily I didn't, I didn't you know, have too much heavy lifting in the show. But I think it's just one of those things where – you you know obviously you're in your own head yep. so you perceive just that I I wasn't so I, I I didn't think that was a job that I particularly excelled at I've got to say we'll agree to disagree but I hear what you're saying <laughs> what are you most proud of uh, my my friends my family my my networks any advice you want to give to people who want to try something different or new but perhaps a bit fearful of doing so. Feel the fear and do it anyway. I feel like in the um, book that I forgot to talk about, um, the top five regrets of the dying, she talks about that a lot as well. It is very good advice because often we want to sweep it under the rug. Yeah. Um, if you could go back into a time when you were first starting out, what advice would you give yourself and why? I would, yeah, I would say, as we were just discussing, just, Stick with it. Stay on the path. Do what you're doing. Yes, you will be poor. Yes, you will have unemployment. <laughs> yes, you will. All those things. But, you know, stick with it and practice and all is coming, as they say. Very nice. I also saw that you're doing a show, what's it called? Cool Mum? Oh, Cool Mum, yeah. Yes. A little TikTok show. Please tell me about that. It looks very interesting and a TikTok this show. Is, yeah, wonderful. So it's this wonderful show about um, a child who comes out as non-binary and their mum tries to be which super supportive, which is me, tries to be super supportive and throw a great party. And um, the kid doesn't want the party, but the mum insists. And it's made for TikTok, so it's 10 one-minute episodes. Uh, it has a huge TikTok star, Samantha Andrew, in it. Um and, yeah, it's currently on the platform and I don't really – I mean, I don't mind – I've looked at TikTok a little bit now just having done this series. Um, it's a whole new so world. Yeah, it's a whole new <laughs> world. And I don't quite understand the algorithm or the, all the things, but it was really fun to do. <laughs> How do people find that? At Cool Mum Series. Cool Mum Series. On TikTok. That is – what was your reaction – because TikTok's like for the inverted commas, this new wave, even younger generation than me. Mm. What was your reaction when you realised it'd be on TikTok? 
Um, well, it came about because a beautiful u- unit person on the Heights, so someone who sets up the tables and everything, sat down one day. We we're having a great chat. We used to chat every day, and he said, um, "I really want to be a writer, but I, I can't get anything up, and none of my friends are actors." And I said, well, "Write something for me. I'll be in it." That's and, so nice of you. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, a year later, he said, "Can I put this into Screen West?" There's funding for a TikTok development and so wow. it all came from there. That is Yeah, it's cool, huh? It's amazing the opportunities that can be presented. Yeah. Well good for you and good for that gentleman. Um before we go, mm-hmm. what is the one question I should have asked you? How to make kitchery. And how do you do that? Oh yeah, great. Okay. So here <laughs> <laughs> fennel seeds, cumin seeds, um uh bay leaf, uh and then you yeah, lentils and your rice half a cup of each and then you put some water in and you stir with a lot of love and then you put some turmeric some more cumin seeds in i put a few cardamom pods and i live on it i have no idea what that is (laughs) it's like your basic ashram food so it's um very nutritionally balancing and in india they use it a lot when people are feeling uh unwell or off color i'm gonna grab that recipe it is ever written down the greatest or i can just listen to this Oh, and I will send it to you. Because, Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else, anything you wanted to tie up? <laughs> I think that's great because I'm going to be doing that here, here first. Anything you wanted to tie up before we ask how people can follow you or keep up to date with you? Or No, it has been wonderful. Thank you so much. I've Thank enjoyed you. it immensely. Me too. And we're not quite done yet. Uh-huh. How can people follow you, keep up to date with you and all of that stuff like social media or anything like that? Ah, uh, I don't know. Do well... <laughs> <laughs> I post nothing of interest, so it's kind of... We'll also agree to disagree because that's where I got some uh, of the information. Um, do you know your Instagram handle? I'll, um, I'll upload it. Oh, in. yeah. So I think it's I think I do an underscore. So I think it's at Roz, R-O-Z, underscore, Hammond. Okay. If it's not the, oh, yeah, it's link, not. <laughs> the link will be in the episode notes okay. so people can check it out. So awesome. Thank you. You're amazing. Thank You're you. super conscious, empowering, motivating. Very resilient, and I love your mindset on life. It's very awesome and contagious. Oh, thank you so much for today. I have loved it. Thank you. I love Roz's take on persistence and following her passion. She's all about perseverance and the mindset that if you love what you're doing, keep going. Of course, there'll be moments in our lives where taking a rest or reevaluating the path is still important, but essentially, determination is the key. As Dweck says, preserving entails effort and practice. It also involves our ability to learn from failure and try again when thrown off our horses until we get thrown off no more. So I'll leave you with this amazing quote by Thomas Fowler Buxton. With ordinary talent and extraordinary perseverance, all things are attainable. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast exploring the deeper side of comedy.